Well, welcome back to uh, Engineering 201, Electrical Fundamentals. And I wanted to pick up where we left off last time. We were talking about equivalent resistance, parallel and series resistance, and uh, do a couple of problems that uh, should be pretty easy, but oftentimes students find this type of problem kind of difficult. So let's look at uh, this problem here. And these are two entirely different problems. I'll just put them on the same page because they're uh, similar in, in what they're asking us to do, but uh, completely different. Uh, uh, different in terms of the values and things like that. Um, so if we were looking at this arrangement of resistors and we were trying to find this equivalent resistance between points A and B, the relationship between this 2 ohm resistor and that 3 ohm resistor is very difficult to figure out. I'm not sure what it is. Uh, but like I mentioned last time, if you go to the uh, far edge, if you're trying to find the equivalent resistance here, if you go to the extreme side and work your way back, um, so if we go over here, we, we easily recognize that we have these two resistors that are in parallel. So we would say that we had uh, 4 in parallel with 2, um, which would be uh, product, or, I'm sorry, not in parallel. I've messed this up already. Um, those are in series. This thing in 4 in parallel with 2 would not be easy math. Something was up there. So back up on that. Those are in series. That is, any current that goes through this one is going to go through that one. They are in a series arrangement. So you have something that is as easy as 4 plus 2. They are in series. So with 4 plus 2, we end up with 6 ohms, right? Then it's uh, worth redrawing, and I uh, stressed before redrawing. So let's go ahead and we'll take this uh, 2 ohms here, this 3 ohms here, and this newly found 6 ohms that we had. And we'll put that 6 ohms there. And then we recognize that now we can talk about parallel, that these are in parallel, that I have 3 ohms in parallel with uh, 6 ohms, which I could uh, calculate as uh, 1 over 1 over uh, 3 plus 1 over 6, or I could say that that was equal to product 3 times 6 divided by 3 plus 6. At any rate, you come up with 2, don't you? Wouldn't that be, what, 18 over 9? Yep, 2 ohms. So then I redraw again, where I take this 2 ohms here, right there. I've got the original two ohms there and I could say then that the equivalent resistance looking into there is as easy as two ohms plus two ohms which is four ohms. Okay, so practice that type of a, uh, a problem. Once you get used to it, it's really pretty easy. Now, uh, this problem over here, an entirely different problem, and I asked what the equivalent resistance is. It, it has a little bit of a difficulty here. You'll notice if we go to this uh, far end and start working our way back, just like what's worked well here, we have uh, something that uh, goes here. We have this wire that goes from there to there, which we might call a short. So maybe someone has put a wire in there. Maybe a wire is broke. Maybe some water's got in there. Something has got shorted out. You've probably heard that terminology. And when current comes up to this point, if you have some current there coming to that point, it has a decision. It could either go here through this 2 ohms of resistance, or it could go through virtually no resistance. This is 0 ohms of resistance. Okay. Well, any self-respecting current is going to go through 0 ohms of resistance before it goes through 2 ohms of resistance. Current, like a lot of things, uh, certainly people, seek the path of least resistance. So no self-respecting current is going to go through this. So we can effectively remove that. So um, that might worth, be worth a redraw right up front. So I now have something like this, 2 ohms and 2 ohms and 2 ohms. And then I recognize very quickly that these two are in parallel. That is, current getting to this point now is a choice of going there or there. So it's in parallel. So I have 2 ohms in parallel with 2 ohms. And again, you can use product over sum uh, or the uh, inverse of the sum of the inverses. When you come up with that, it is 1 ohm. It's always pretty easy when the resistors are the same. It's just half the value. Uh, so 1 ohm, so I'll redraw again, 
I have now this uh, resistor here. That's 2 ohms. And I have then the 1 ohm from over there. And I could say then that the equivalent resistance is equal to 2 ohms plus 1 ohm, which would be, of course, 3 ohms. Okay, so uh, a little different problem. We have a short in here, and I wanted to talk about how to uh, how to do that. You've got some uh, homework problems. A homework problem, I think, uh, talks about that, and I wanted to to bring that out. So hopefully, a couple of good problems. Recapping a little bit from last time. Remember when you have parallel uh, resistance that as you add resistance in parallel, you're going to decrease the total resistance. And when you add resistance in series, that you're going to increase the total resistance. Well, let's move on then. And I'd like to look at other things that we put in series and parallel. Maybe we should talk a little bit about sources in uh, series and parallel. So if I look at uh, series and parallel sources, maybe I'll take some uh, voltage sources here and I'll arrange them like this. So we'll say that we have uh, 12 volts here and 12 volts here and 12 volts here. So if this is 12 then and that's 12 and this is 12. I could ask the question then what's this voltage and that would of course be 12 plus 12 plus 12 which is 36 volts. So you can start to uh, when you put sources in series you you increase the voltage. You can start to uh, daisy chain them together. For instance we take some 9 volt batteries here You say this is a minus and positive, minus and positive, 9 volts, 9 volts, 9 volts, like this. If I hook then this uh, positive to that negative, I hook that positive to that negative, and I come up here and I look at the voltage between these two. What voltage do I have between there? I have 27 volts, don't I? So you could have a small stack of 9 volt batteries and get quite a bit of voltage. You get into a dangerous uh, voltage range. Certainly a 9 volt battery has enough current uh, to cause someone some damage. So um, I guess if you've got a stack of 9 volt batteries, be careful when you're playing around because you can get uh, a significant voltage uh, fairly quickly. If you have 109 volt batteries, you'd have, what, 900 volts if you put them in, in series. So you can do some real damage with that. Um, probably your batteries in your calculator are arranged in series. You've got uh, a, a bunch of AA batteries or AAA batteries, depending on what calculator you have and whatnot. And they probably may look like, physically, like they're arranged in parallel. Uh, but they're probably arranged in series so that they can get... Uh, uh, four and a half or uh, six volts out of the uh, group of batteries and, and start to do something with that. So it's not necessarily physically how they are uh, set in there, but actually how they're, they're hooked up. Well, uh, so that's series. What if we look at uh, parallel? Well, with uh, parallel, I might take my voltages, my voltage sources, and arrange them like this. So we'll say 12 volts and 12 volts and 12 volts. And the question comes up, how much voltage do you have across there? Of course, the answer is 12 volts. We know that things in parallel have the same voltage across them. These have to have 12 volts across them. Well, so what's the advantage? Well, if we look at some current here, let's say I1 going out of that battery and I2 out of that battery, and I3 out of this battery, what's the current here? Well, that's going to be I1 plus I2 plus I3, isn't it? 
And oftentimes in uh, automotive, if you have an engine that starts hard, maybe it's a, a big ornery engine or a diesel engine or something like that, you may end up taking two 12 volt batteries and you're going to put them in to parallel. So we take our 12 volt battery here and our 12 volt battery here. And we would hook this terminal to that, and this terminal to that, and across uh, here, we would again just have 12 volts, but we'd have a lot more uh, current. Now, sometimes in uh, big engine applications, truck applications, and whatnot, they will. The military also uh, sometimes will be using 24 volts, but um, you go down and get yourself a, a you know, for small. Uh, uh, mid-sized diesel engine or something it's probably going to have two batteries but they will be arranged in parallel so that you still have a 12 volt system this is a lot nicer because you can still run your accessories at 12 volts and things like that uh, your, you know pioneer stereo at 24 volts does not last very long so those are some uh, advantages and uh, applications of uh, sources in parallel and series and we, we see them in uh, arranged both ways depending on what you're what you're looking at Let's see here. We've got. Might talk a little bit more about resistors. I guess this is uh, page number two. Talk a little bit more about uh, resistors and loads in parallel and series before we leave this. So, with uh, this, let's say that uh, we've got the, uh, the old string of Christmas lights here. And we arrange the resistors, the light bulbs. That's really, we can just model the light bulbs with a resistor like that. Okay? So those are, uh, each one of these represents a light, and it will uh, glow nicely, and you can decorate however you want to. The problem with this is what happens if this one burns out? It becomes open, doesn't it? So you end up with a situation that uh, looks like this. I don't have enough. I didn't draw all the resistors back in here, but I think you get the idea. This is open. Okay. When that's open, no current will flow. So not only is this not light not on, it's off, but so is this one. This is off and that's off. That's why these are hard to troubleshoot because all of them will be off. If any one of them is burnt out and doesn't let current go through, none of them will be on. So you end up having to take a, a, hopefully a good bulb and go through and check. And then if two of the bulbs are burnt out at once, uh, it can be a real nightmare sorting it out. What's a um, maybe a different way, a better way of doing this? would be to arrange our loads like this, right? Okay, so now if this one gets burned out, you still have a path for current through this one, it'll be on, a path for current through that one, it'll be on, a path for current for that, it'll be on. Um, so uh, in, in that regard, having them in parallel is probably a real advantage because if one of them burns out it will be uh, off it'll be dark you'll see it you can replace it you're back in business now you might say well, well why would anyone ever use series well sometimes series can be good let's say that we have a uh, scenario here where we have like in an overhead projector where I used to shine uh, before we had a lot of computer projection systems and whatnot we take these transparencies and shine them up on the uh, the wall and we would have a very big light and then that uh, big, great big light made a lot of heat and tended to set the thing on fire so we'd try and keep it cool off we would put a fan in there okay and we would usually have them in series like this because um, what happens if the uh, fan went bad the fan seized up wasn't working anymore burnt up and wasn't running would you want the light to continue on? Probably not. You don't want to get in a situation where the fan is not running and the the lights on. So a lot of times they would put those in series. So if something went wrong with the fan, 
uh, hopefully the light would not run. So uh, sometimes with safety circuits, a series is a good arrangement. Your uh, uh, transmission or clutch safety switch and your ignition is usually in series in your automobile so that you have to have the clutch depressed or the transmission in neutral and engage the ignition switch before it'll start. So th there's a lot of good uses for uh, series. Uh, but uh, there's also good uses for parallel. I just wanted to, to point some of those out. It would be, be kind of a scary car that you could start by shoving in the clutch pedal or the ignition, either one. That would be a little dicey because that would be a parallel arrangement, right? Okay, well, let's move on then. I wanted to uh, look at Kirchhoff's Laws. So, let's see, what are we, page four? Kirchhoff's Laws. Okay, so Kirchhoff, some people call it, pronounce it Kirchhoff's, probably more common to call it Kirchhoff's, then lots of debate on spelling it. Typically, the probably most common is two H's and two F's. We had a good textbook one time, spelled it two different ways throughout the textbook. Um, but Kirchhoff's Laws, that's the way I'm going to go with it, two H's and two F's. And there are two laws, Kirchhoff's Current Law and Kirchhoff's Voltage Law. So let's start with his Current Law. I think that's probably a little easier than go to his Voltage Law. And uh, oftentimes we we'll use the abbreviation KCL. You shouldn't use that in formal writing. Uh, but if we're just jotting things down, KCL, Kirchhoff's current law, and then we don't have to fight about how many H's and F's. But what we have here is you could imagine a variety of conductors or wires coming in to a uh, point. And eventually we'll call that, instead of a point, we'll call it a node. But let's say that I have... Uh, current one coming in here, maybe current two leaving, uh, maybe current three leaving, and then I have current four going in. Okay. So Kirchhoff's current law says that the algebraic sum of all currents entering or leaving a point is zero. Okay, so the algebraic sum of all currents entering or leaving a point is zero. We might talk a little bit about this algebraic. You have to be careful to treat if it's going in differently than if it's going out. That will be a, a difference of a sign. And then uh, usually point, we'll probably not call that point too much longer. We'll call it a node. So, so algebraic sum of all currents entering or leaving a node is equal to zero. So what's that look like mathematically? Over here I could say that I have uh, I1 is going in minus I2 because that's leaving minus I3 because that's leaving plus I4. That's going in. Kirchhoff says that's equal to zero. So we took in as positive, didn't we? You might say, well, could you take out as positive? Sure. If we took out as positive, we'd have minus I1 plus I2 plus I3, is that right? 2 is out, 3 is out, yep. And then minus I4 because it's going in, it's equal to 0. Are those the same equation? Certainly. Take this first equation, multiply it both sides by minus 1, you get that second equation. Probably, um, the maybe the better way to think about this is, is take either one of these and rearrange it where I have I1 plus I4 is equal to I2 plus I3. What do I have there? I1 and I4, that's what's going in, is equal to 2 and 3. That's what's going out. So this is, like I said, the, probably the easier one to think about because we, we tend to recognize what goes in uh, has to be what goes out. If there's a, if, <coughs> excuse me, for our civil engineering friends, if this is an intersection, the number of cars going into it has to equal the number of cars 
leaving that intersection unless we're making cars or chopping cars at that intersection. So, <coughs> excuse me. Pretty straightforward. What goes in has to equal what goes out. Well, Kirchhoff's voltage law is really as, as simple, but people struggle with it a little bit more. So, let's look at uh, Kirchhoff's voltage law. Which we'll say is KVL, Kirchhoff's voltage law. Well, let's take a, a circuit here. Let's say that we have some source VS, then we'll have a, a couple of resistors. Like that. So what Kirchhoff's voltage law says is that the algebraic sum of all voltage drops or gains around a path is zero. So the algebraic, we have to keep track of whether it's a gain or a drop. The algebraic sum of all voltage drops or gains around a path is zero. And eventually we won't call this a path, we'll call it a loop or maybe a mesh. Um, but uh, so let's, let's start here. If I start here and I uh, go through this uh, source, that looks like a gain, so let me say that I have Vs. And I continue working around here. I'm going now from positive to negative, so that's a drop minus V1. I keep on going from positive to negative minus V2. Gets me back to where I started, and Kirchhoff says that's equal to zero. You might say, well, you might say, well how did you know to, to take the uh, Vs as positive? Well, I, I took a gain as positive. What if I took a drop as positive? Could I do a drop as positive? Yeah, I'd have minus Vs plus V1 plus V2 is equal to zero, right? Same equation. I take this first equation, multiply both sides by minus 1, I get the second equation, don't I? So this is probably the one that I will uh, tend to use more. It seems like most circuits we have more drops than we have gains in terms of we usually have more uh, loads than we have sources. And I can then minimize the uh, negative signs. You see here I have two negative signs I have to worry about losing. Here I only have one negative sign I have to worry about losing. A little bit unintuitive, but that's the, the reason that I do that. Well, if I take either one of these and rearrange it, I could say that I have Vs is equal to V1 plus V2. So while a lot of times we might have uh, more, in terms of sheer numbers, drops than gains, the, the sum of these... The, the size of these all put together is equal to each other. And we can say that the gain is equal to the drop. That's what Kirchhoff's voltage law is about. Those of you that uh, think about potential energy uh, recognize this. If we uh, go somewhere and we go up some stairs and then we go to another part of the building and we come back down the stairs, Come back to our starting point. What's the sum of the drops and gains of our potential energy? It's equal to zero, isn't it? So uh, you've probably seen this concept before, but maybe not with this exact terminology. So that's Kirchhoff's voltage law. Let's see if we can put these uh, to work for us. So what I'd like to do is come up with our expressions for voltage division and current division. So let's start out with a circuit similar to what we saw for Kirchhoff's voltage law. I'll take this as Vs and uh, 
do something like this. We could have more resistors if we wanted to, but uh, I'm going to say that this is R1, this is R2, so this is V2 positive to negative, this is V1 positive to negative, and I'm going to say that this current is, I'll just say it's I. Okay. So I'm going to use now Kirchhoff's voltage law. And what I'm going to say is that if I start here and go around there, I've got that uh, Vs is equal to V1 plus V2. Is that right? I think so. And then I'm going to use Ohm's law. V is equal to IR in general. That's my general equation. So I could say then that Vs would be equal to uh, I, so it's not I1, just plain old I, I times R1. Because this current's going to go through this one, it's also going to go through that one. Remember that elements that are in uh, series have the same current going through them. So that's going to be I times R1 plus what's V2? That's going to be I times R2, isn't it? So I have I times R1 plus I times R2. Well, I could tidy this up. I'll have Vs is equal to I times R1 plus R2. And rearrange again Vs divided by R1 plus R2 is going to be equal to I. Yes, I think we're okay with that. Well, at this point, I'd like to make a substitution. One of my substitutions is going to be that I is equal to V1 over R1. Can I say that? I mean, rearranging this, I is equal to V over R, isn't it? So this current here going through this would be V1 over R1. So when I make that substitution, I can say that Vs over R1 plus R2 is equal to, Vs over R1 plus R2 is equal to V1 over R1. And when I solve for V1, what do I come up with? V1 is equal to Vs times this ratio of R1 divided by R1 plus R2. Okay. Now I'm going to make another substitution here and then I'm going to talk about what I came up with. So here, allow me to make this substitution. I could have come down here and talked about the current going through that resistor, which would be the same. I is then equal to V2 divided by R2, isn't it? Same current. So when I make that substitution, I could say that uh, Vs divided by R1 plus R2 is now equal to V2 over R2. Is that right? Yeah. So when I solve this for V2, I can say that V2 is equal to Vs times this ratio of cross-multiplying R2 divided by R1 plus R2. So these are my two equations, and these have a very distinct name. This is voltage division. Okay, voltage division. We talked about this a little bit in GE 101. If you weren't with us in GE 101 or probably have forgot it, that's okay. Um, I gave you the equations. We didn't derive them, but they're really quite derivable if you use Kirchhoff's voltage law. That is to say that the voltage across this resistor is equal to the total voltage across the two resistors times the value of that resistance divided by the sum total of the resistances. resistances. Likewise, V2, the voltage across this resistor, is equal to the total voltage across these two. There's the total voltage across those, Vs, times R2 over R1 plus R2. If you do a units analysis on this, this quantity R1 divided by R1 plus R2, the units in ohms or K ohms, whatever that is, will cancel, and we're left with volts equals volts, so the units do work out. One thing to note on this, of course, is that what? V1 plus V2 has to equal Vs. We saw this up there. So, you can always check your work with that when you get down there. You get a value for V1 or V2 that has to meet that. Or if you get a value for V1 and you don't want to have to do V2, you know it's just the difference between V1 and Vs. So those are the voltage div division equations. You've maybe seen those before. If not, 
Um, a lot of times students usually commit them to memory because we just use them so often, but uh, if you forget them, they are quite derivable. Well, if there's voltage division, there must be current division. So let's see if we can get to the bottom, get to the bottom of that. So, put a couple of resistors here. I'm going to take a current source. I'm going to say this is IS. And a couple of resistors here. Say so this is R1 and R2. I'm going to say that this current here is I1. I'm going to say that this current here is I2. And I could talk about the voltage across here. I could talk about this voltage from there to there. We'll say that that is just plain old V. We know that the voltage across here is the same as the voltage across there. The voltage across this resistor R1, the voltage across the resistor R2 has to be the same because they are in parallel, right? Well, if I use Kirchhoff's current law then, and at this point you know that you have IS coming in here, and it's going to split, so it's going to go to I1 and I2. <clears throat> so we could say that IS is equal to I1 plus I2, right? Pretty straightforward. And then if I again use Ohm's law, V is equal to IR, or I is equal to V over R, it comes from that certainly. I could say that IS is equal to I1. Use Tell me about I1. I could really say that that is equal to V divided by R1, isn't it? And likewise, I2 would be V divided by R2. So if I tidy this up a little bit, I could say that I have IS is equal to V times 1 over R1 plus 1 over R2, which if I go through and get common denominator and then go through that math stuff, I have V times R1 plus R2 divided by R1 times R2. Okay, so I could say that this current is equal to the voltage times the sum over the product. Well again, I'm going to make a couple substitutions. I'm going to substitute in the notion that we could define V as being equal to I1 times R1. Does that work? Going back to Ohm's law, this voltage here, yeah. If you knew I1 and R1, you could get that voltage. So when I substitute that in, I have a little hasty on my arrow here. So when I substitute that in, I have that IS is equal to V, which I'm now going to say is I1 times R1 times then R1 plus R2 over R1 times R2. So if I solve for I1 then, what does I1 turn out to be here? Solving for I1, uh, those this cancels, doesn't it? And I could say that's equal to IS times R2 divided by R1 plus R2. Okay. Now again, I'm going to do another substitution, come up with another equation and talk about those. So let me do the substitution here. V is equal to I2 times R2. Is that true? Yeah. Same voltage across both of these, so I could define this voltage across here. be the same voltage as I2 times R2. So when I make that substitution, I come up with IS is equal to I2 times R2 times then the quantity R1 plus R2 divided by R1 R2 to cancel that with that. And solving for I2, I come up with IS times R1 divided by R1 plus R2. 
And these are the equations then for current division. Okay, current division. And again, you saw those in uh, GE 101. If you weren't with us in that class or uh, you forgot about it, not a problem. Most students, again, will, will memorize these, but they are really quite derivable. So what that says is if I'm looking for this current here, I1, I take the total current going into this point. I multiply by the other resistor because as this resistor gets higher, that's going to force more current over here, right? Current seeks the path of least resistance. So as this value gets larger, that's going to make I1 larger. As I2 gets smaller, I1 gets smaller because if R2 is small, more current will go through here. Then likewise, I2, this current here, is going to be equal to the total current times this other resistor. I always think of with current division as the uh, other. Use the other resistor divided by the sum of the two resistors. Again, a unit analysis on this. This quantity here, the ratio of the resistors, uh, go, the um, units cancel out, and you have amps is equal to amps. So uh, that works out pretty well. Let me double check that. Good with that. So that's your uh, voltage division. Very derivable, but like I said, a lot of times people will memorize them because we just use it so much. Or current division. And again, a lot of times people will just memorize these. It's not too tough if you just remember you, it's the opposite because uh, we use them quite a bit. Well, the last thing that I, I wanted to, uh, to mention here is with uh, equivalent resistance. We started out with a lecture with, with equivalent resistance. You have to be really careful. And this is going to come up in laboratory. Let's say that you have a circuit here. And um, maybe you've got some resistors here like this. And you want to measure the what that resistance is. Okay. Well, do you take your uh, ohm meter and put it across there? No, certainly not. First of all, you never use the ohm meter on an energized circuit. So this, this is probably a bad from the get-go. So what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to de-energize the circuit, unhook it. So maybe we'll have a switch here and we'll have this open. So why we would take voltage measurements, we might take current measurements on an ener energized circuit. And you really have to on an energized circuit. You never take resistance measurements on an energized circuit. Now, if we have this resistor here, we take our ohm meter and we put across this thing. That's better. It's not energized. We're still not going to get the right value because what are we measuring? We're going to be measuring the equivalent resistance. Okay. We're going to be measuring the equivalent resistance. This is measuring equivalent resistance. It's going to measure the equivalent resistance of both of those. So how do we do this? Well, what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to Again, make sure the circuit is not energized. Then we're going to have to pull the resistor out of the circuit. And you can do that by really just unhooking one end of that. Okay. If I then take my ohm meter, looks like a face. So my ohm meter here and put it across there. I mean, if, 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 if you feel better about unhooking both ends, that's fine. You certainly don't have to because by just unhooking this, by opening this, that's removed from the circuit and is not going to be uh, part of it. And quite frankly, even if you were to hook this back up, there'd still be no current through that and you could make the ohm measurement. So be careful when you're measuring resistance in lab. Do not measure equivalent resistance. First of all, don't do it on an energized circuit. And then second of all, if you want the resistance of just this single resistor, you got to take it out. You got to unhook it, or you're going to be measuring the equivalent resistance. Well, that's a, a good way to uh, end the uh, uh, 
video, the, the, the lecture here, give you some things to think about uh, as you go in and do your homework problems and start to prepare for the, uh, the laboratories that will be upcoming. Uh, thank you for watching and take care until next time.